Hey everybody, this is Brian. I uh, hope everybody's doing well. Uh, I wanted to do a podcast kind of getting everybody up to speed for the Brian Kohlberger hearing, uh, which is happening on Friday. Um, if you're watching this later on, the Friday I'm talking about is the uh, the 26th. Kind of going through the uh, the new elements, the things that might happen on Friday just to get everybody up to speed because we haven't had a hearing in a while. Um, if I sound a little like weird or sick, I'm actually a little under the weather. Uh, and kind of a little bit beat down. I was in um, New Hampshire for a week covering the the primary there, which is kind of interesting covering politics for a week, week since I've been on the crime beat for a while. But it's actually kind of kind of funny. Like I was in some of the voting locations and people were wanting to talk to me about all the, the crime stories. But it was an interesting week doing that. My Half my family is actually from New Hampshire. So I uh, got to see a lot of them, but ended up getting some kind of sickness. So I sound a little under the weather. And if you hear weird snoring, by the way, during this podcast, my dogs are sleeping behind me and one of them snores really, really loud. Um, I have a golden retriever in a lab. So um, but anyway, we're going to get you up to speed on the Brian Koberger uh, developments, what to expect with the hearing. We're going to have Sarah Azari on, um, one of the News Nation legal contributors. I had her go over all the new motions. She's going to help break them down for us. Uh, I was planning on going to the hearing on Friday in Idaho. I had a plane ticket booked, but had some kind of family issues, family drama come up. And I'm also a little bit sick now, so I'm going to um, sit this one out. We'll, of course, be covering it anyway. And there's the live stream, too, um, by the way, which I'll tweet out so we can um, all watch the new live stream. The judge is going to be live streaming the hearings now. But... So just wanted everybody to uh, kind of know what to expect for Friday. Okay, so Sarah Azari uh, is is with us now, and she texted me before that she was going to look awful and in a sweatshirt and was making sure that that was okay. And then, of course, you look, like, great. <laughs> At least we match, right? We're yeah, awkward. I was just talking about how I'm sick, so you'll just have to... Um, I'm sorry. Uh, it's not COVID, though, right? No, I don't know. I haven't done the test, but I don't think so. I think it's just everybody's been sick. Yeah. That's a little blurry. Funny how everyone's getting camera. sick. And, everyone's getting sick and no one's testing. They're like, whatever it is, it is. Yeah, it's everybody's <laughs> everyone in my family's sick. Um, but I wanted to go through with you. I just wanted people to have a little um explainer on what to expect with Friday, because we yeah. haven't had a hearing in a while. It's, and you know. Just they may announce a court date, which a trial date, which would be significant. But I just wanted—I mean, you're you always like do your homework with these kinds of assignments. You study and you kind of read, read all the motions and everything. So let's talk first. There's the eleven. Um, there's the eleven a.m. Uh, close to the public hearing. Right. Um, what should we expect to happen during that? Yeah. So it's a long day of hearings. You know, eleven a.m., one p.m. And both of these hearings are on Koberger's motion to reconsider orders that denied the motions to dismiss the indictment. And then if that's denied, he seeks permission to appeal those interim orders. Uh, and, and then if that, you know, if, if, if he's appealing, then he wants the proceedings stayed. Remember, he tried to do this once before as yeah. well. The yeah. stay got lifted. So then that would just, you know, prolong the trial. But the morning hearing, Brian, you were saying 11 a.m., it's sealed and not open to the public. Um, it sounds like the defense is coming in with something new that merits uh, reconsideration of the denial of the motion to dismiss the indictment. Right. Okay, I'm just going to bring it down because you're talking like a smart lawyer. So I'm going to I'm going to dump it down a little bit. So and tell me if I'm wrong. So basically, Brian Koberg's defense tried to throw out the grand jury indictment saying maybe jury tampering had some other reasons listed. We never got to know them all because a lot of the hearings for that were in secret. Um, right. And the judge said, no, we're not throwing out the indictment. Mm -hmm. We're moving forward. And now, right. they're, now they're but coming the judge back. Also, but, but they did get the transcripts, right? So right. they're saying there was bias. So they got the, the transcripts of what happened, the, the grand jury proceedings. Correct. There, there, there was bias in the grand jury. There was inadmissible evidence. There was lack of sufficient evidence. Um, but remember, the standard is very low. It's probable cause. And they're saying there's lack of sufficient evidence for probable cause and that there was prosecutorial misconduct. That gets denied, right? That got denied. That, so everything was going to move forward. Exactly. And now they're saying, wait, can you please reconsider that denial and maybe grant it? <laughs> And usually when we go in and 
uh, file a motion for reconsideration and we're heard on it, it's because there's something that we're arguing that we didn't know before, that we didn't have before. So there's something new that the defense is bringing to the table for the judge to consider. That whole proceeding is going to be sealed. Why? Because in the grand jury, there's evidence presented to the grand jury. And so, you know, as you know, <laughs> and you, you're frustrated like me, we don't know what's going on in this case. And so that's all hush hush secret. But then the afternoon hearing focuses on the one argument. Again, it's still related to the grand jury. Hold on. I just want to stick with the morning one more time. Just so <laughs> you said that. So they're now bringing up this argument again to throw out the grand jury indictment for the second time. Right. They got the transcripts the first time during their argument. So do you think they saw something in those transcripts that they now have something new that they want to argue? Yes, yes. It prompted okay. some sort of investigation. You know, you typically, do, you, you, the court's not going to let you come in uh, and uh, get a second bite of the apple based on the same facts. So there must be some new facts that Koberger is alleging. Okay. Okay. So that's and happening in, in secret at 11 a.m. because grand jury proceedings are secret anyway, and we're right. not going to get to find out what goes on there. Correct. And there's a lot of evidence that was, you know, presented and every, every piece of evidence in this case, except for what's in the probable cause affidavit has been, uh, you know, um, uh, subject to a protective order and not disclosable. And okay. again, and then in the afternoon, we still have, it's still the idea of this whole um, grand jury, a dismissal of the grand jury indictment, but it focuses on a procedural issue, which is the grand jury got inaccurate instructions. I mean, that there's nothing secret about that. So that's a public hearing. But didn't they already have that argument? They've already talked about that in the past. Um, yes, but they have filed a motion to reconsider. Okay, so, so they're bringing that up again. Correct. Um, because remember when they had, I was in the courtroom for that, where the judge said, oh, this is a very creative legal argument. Yes. And, but like, it's not. It doesn't call. apply. Yeah. yeah. So it's they're kind of they're bringing that up again. Yeah, because look, if they have new facts um, that the judge has to consider, then perhaps those erroneous arguments, I mean, uh, instructions that they argue, you know, now now they're in a different context. Right. There's new yeah. facts. Maybe those instructions are necessitated, whereas before they weren't. OK, so both of these. You know, I'm speculating, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, I know you're speculating. Yeah. <laughs> but both of these hearings that are happening, the 11 a.m. and the the afternoon, kind of like procedural stuff. It doesn't sound like anything. I mean, it's important, but it's not they're, they're not. I mean, are these like really significant hearings, would you say? Well, you know, when I when I saw the documents, I thought like you, you know, but I have to say that and our viewers, it's really important to remember that especially in these high profile cases where, you know, there's a protective order, there's a gag order, and then there's this, all this speculation by the public. Um, we don't really know what's going on. And that speculation has hurt Koberger. I mean, that's no secret. So motion filing motions is a way for us to send a, a message. Okay. Mm. It, it allows us to, it allows the public and the media to read between the lines. So, you know, I think she's not just doing this as, as some sort of a stalling tactic or to come before the court. She's really doing this because, you know, that's that, another motion that we're going to talk about right now is the uh, motion to unseal. Yes. Uh, what was it? The uh, it was the motion to unseal. I just have it here. Um, Hold on, I just had it up. Uh, sorry, my dog just walked in. I got distracted. Yeah. Um, so it was the... It's a motion? Actually, actually, we are talking about that motion. The motion to unseal the defendant's motion to reconsider the orders denying... Right, and that was, that was from the defense wanting to unseal that. Yeah, so defense wants some transparency because this opacity has hurt Koberger. And, you know, sometimes... Um, it, it, it's it's even if that initial motion doesn't get unsealed, the arguments in the new motion are how you bring the sunlight into. So the what do they want to unseal? There's so many motions. What do they want to yeah. unseal? They filed a motion to dismiss the indictment, the grand right. jury indictment. Right. And Which that was motion covered. was sealed and they want to unseal that. Okay. 
So and they want they, and I'm just trying to break this down for me to understand and kind of like people who don't understand the law, like like me. I mean, I understand the basics, but not like yeah. a lawyer. So they want to unseal um, the reasons that they're giving of why the indictment should be thrown out. They want the public to know this is what we found out. Yeah, because the public right now knows about the probable, probable cause affidavit, Brian's uh, eyebrows, Brian's demeanor in court. You know, uh, I mean, it everything is pointed to guilt. And so this is one way that we it's a tool that we have to bring in a little bit of sunlight so mm. people can see that, you know, it's not all that you think it is, you know. But, but it seemed I mean, the defense didn't want the cameras in the courtroom, you know, doesn't really seem to like the media. Um, well, because now all was, of a sudden they want to unseal something like, yeah, it, I, like I, a different I, tactic now. I know it seems hypocritical, but um, the defense actually didn't have a problem with cameras in the courtroom until it became a problem. I think what happened was the protocol was not followed. The cameras were zoomed in on Koberger, on documents on the council table. And so they're like, OK, no, this is not a good idea. But I think initially, um, you know, they, they wanted some transparency. Uh, so, you know. It just, I think that that went away when the results didn't turn out that good. Okay. So it, it's interesting. I'm wondering, we don't know because it is sealed, but there's obviously a reason they want it to be made public. There. Yeah, because they've made an argument. Yeah, because, they, because there are things in that motion that argue what was presented to the grand jury that got him indicted. You yeah. Know, they believe there's insufficient evidence. And here we are talking about he's going to get the death penalty. We've already convicted the guy. So, you know, this is Ann Taylor's way of saying, wait, you know, maybe you can hear this other side. But you just know? playing dad, devil's advocate, I'm just trying to think it through. If the defense, you know, wants to make sure there is a unbiased jury, ultimately, and doesn't want information leaking out, like, why would they want the public to know anything? Why would they want this out just to the general public? Well, because this is their motion. So it's going to be all their arguments about why this case does not meet the standard of proof. And we don't have any of that. We we don't we don't know, right? We just yeah. you know, we're just going by the probable cause affidavit. So it's certainly a one-sided argument. It's their motion. It's not the prosecution's opposition to their motion that they're unsealing. It's their motion they're unsealing. So it's going to lay out all the things that are in, in favor of Koberger, why the case doesn't meet the burden, you know, what was the misconduct, you know, what was the bias? Like suddenly now we're going to see a whole different perspective on this case. Okay, so I guess we'll see if if the judge unseals it, then we'll yes. eventually get to see. Okay, yes. so that's another thing that's evolving. Um, and then the other part of the Friday hearing is we may find that out one. a... Um, oh, Tri wait, you, sorry, what? Trial date, scheduling. Trial date, that's what I was going to get to. So the, the, the prosecution has asked for summer um and said you know they want it to be when school's not in session which makes sense you know it'll be quieter in moscow and there's also a a school i think it's a high school right across the street from the courthouse they don't want to interfere it's a small town there's a lot you know they they want to do it when things are calmer um and i've been in touch with the victim's family sarah and like it's hard for them not having a trial date like not having yeah. something there's no light at the end of the tunnel. there's no light at the end of the tunnel there's nothing for them to kind of hold on to knowing that justice right. is coming right. um so do you think we'll get a trial date on friday like is there going to be a date i mean i i i think we're going to get a trial date uh i don't know that it'll be this summer only because i think that if koberger makes an argument that he needs more time um i don't see the court not giving him more time because it is a death penalty case and that death penalty portion of the case it takes so long to put together, uh, you know, all the mitigation. And remember, they hired a mitigation attorney. Everyone was saying, oh, they're wasting money on too many attorneys. But you really do need a separate attorney for that portion of the case. And so that really is what, to me, merits more time for the defense. But remember that in that other motion that we just talked about to unseal the motion to, you know, uh, dismiss the grand jury indictment, one of the things she's saying is that, um if you deny that and you don't unseal the grant the motion to 
dismiss the grand jury indictment. Then we want to appeal that denial. And we're going to ask that we stay these proceedings until that appeal is is decided. Because listen, if if she appeals the, the ruling of the court, she still has a chance that the grand jury indictment could be dismissed. We, we wouldn't go to trial if it gets dismissed, right? So she's trying to put a pause on the on the trial um, to be able to appeal that denial if the judge denies it on Friday. And when, when you say appeal that denial, if the judge denies it, does that go to like another court? It would go to, yes, it would go. So this is in the trial court. So it would go to the appellate division, whatever it's called in, in Idaho. I, well, I didn't realize you can do all that. I, I always thought like appeals came after a trial. I didn't know you could like appeal things. They're, inter, they're interlocutory appeals. So these are like lower level appeals. I don't know exactly where this will go in in Idaho, but it doesn't yeah. go to the same. It doesn't go to the same judge that denied it. It okay. goes to a judge above him. So summer, though, I'm just thinking like if there was a summer trial, June, July, August, we're almost into February. You just got to plan your vacation. Okay, well, yeah, I, I'm going to be there. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to be a long haul. But, but I mean, um, that's still kind of like four or five months away. Is that yeah. not enough time to get things together? I mean. Listen, there's one other order that we haven't talked about that also might merit further delay, uh, we'll, we'll, which we'll talk about. But this is a big case, you know? I mean, you know, when you have one body, it takes time. It's a death penalty case. You have four bodies here. You have four, you know what I'm saying? I mean, you have uh, witnesses, you have forensics, you have a, a huge part of this case, which is IgG, which we'll talk about, which has been only partially disclosed to the defense. And so, and then it's a death penalty case. Like if there's just all of these alone are reasons why I think a trial won't happen in the summer and you put them all together. I'm like, definitely not thinking it will happen this summer, but strange yeah. things can happen. I guess we'll just see. Yeah, we all. And that's what you know, she's really trying. She's really making one last attempt to get the indictment thrown out. And did you see this other issue? The prosecution also asked um, that he no longer, that Coburger no longer be allowed to file an alibi. Did you see that? Yeah. That, me too. Mean, what does that mean? Remember, his alibi was not a traditional alibi, but it really, it did. Because then he likes to go for long drives, which was. Right, right by himself. Yeah. I mean, even you're laughing like. Yeah. Which also, well, because it's problematic to me. I've always said that yeah. the long drives around the same time of the morning when his cell phone was connecting to the towers. And then this one time it didn't, that's a problem. And, and that alibi confirms that, you know, he was in the area on these other occasions and his cell phone connected. Um, so I, it wasn't a real, I don't want to say real, but it wasn't what we're typically seeing an alibi, which gives you you know, exact location, who you were with, witnesses who could corroborate your alibi, all that. It wasn't any of that. But it did check off the box of preserving his, like he met the statutory requirement, the deadline. Mm -hmm. And and listen, an alibi is such a huge uh, event in a case that sh should it come up, I don't think a judge, and it's like a true alibi, I don't think a judge is going to say, well, you missed the mark and I'm not going to let you you know, present right. your alibi. But why would the prosecution ask that he no longer be allowed to file an alibi? I think the prosecution is maybe concerned. You know, he said that he is leaving it open to yeah. file, an addition, you know, an alibi based on witnesses from the from the prosecution that are going to testify at trial. And I think that, you know, prosecutors hate being in limbo. They want to know what they're looking at. They want to yeah. know how to prep their witnesses. They want to know how to prep their case. And all this like, well, okay, I checked it off the box, but I'm still leaving the door open to come back with more. I mean, it really is the worst. I mean, for, it's bad for defense attorneys too. Like if the vice versa happens, we throw a fit because, you know, you got to, you got to be fair, right? We got to know yeah. what we're looking at. So I think the prosecution is it's kind of on edge because they don't know if they're going to trial or not. You know, they don't really have a trial date that, that really, that is the worst thing you can do to a prosecutor's, you know, kind of not leave it to the last minute to announce ready uh, or agree to a trial date. And then, you know, on top of it, they don't know if the guy's going to come up with an alibi. I mean, an alibi is a huge piece of the defense, right? Yeah. If you have one, you don't yeah, have to. I have get like why, um, you know, our constitution, obviously, and you have to protect 
defendants' rights and have a fair trial, especially with the death penalty case. But I just do go back to the victims' families. Like, you know, there's just so many yeah. ups and downs with this court process. And, like, it's, like, that feeling of not knowing. It, it just feels like anything could, oh, God, there's going to be some other motion filed. And how are you supposed to plan your life or, like, know when to take your vacation days like yes. families, I mean, they literally have to think about that. Like when, yes. when can, when do they take vacation days for, you know, how are you supposed to plan anything? Right. And, you know, some people have jobs that are, there's some yeah. people are self-employed. I imagine some of these parents might be self-employed and God, I mean, if I, <laughs> I'm always stressing if, a, if I get picked for a jury, which I never would, but uh, you know, how do I, how do I take off from work? Cause they right. don't, you know, yeah, it's hard. I, I really, hard. I never thought about that part of it until talking to some of them and like realizing like, Oh yeah, you have to like, you know, if it goes on, if it's a two month trial, like they have to figure that out. You can't just spring that on people, you know? Exactly. exactly. Um, anything else, Sarah, that strikes you that we should think about for before Friday before. Yeah. Friday. Yes. There is a pub. Well, I don't know if this is, this is not a hearing on Friday, but this is one of the new orders that was issued by the court that I thought was significant. I know you're going to laugh at me and say it's an IgG thing and I'm all over IgG, but it is important. And it does go to the trial date issue that you brought up because the judge uh, issued a public order for disclosure of IgG material. Um, he had issued a previous order late last fall saying that uh, he will look at the entire IgG file from the prosecution, look and see if any part of it can be disclosed to the defense, because um, the defense has been pressing for that. And the, it it did finish its in-camera hearing and looking at these documents and actually ordered the prosecution to turn over part of the IgG file. So it raises a couple questions is it, what part of the file? I mean, we don't know what's turned over to the defense, but I think anything is better than nothing. And I, I think it's important for our viewers to know that discovery leads to more discovery. Discovery, uh, you know, triggers more defense investigation. And there's been more discovery motions in there that I've seen, like just little requests and stuff. Yeah. So if the court bought the prosecution's argument that somehow this is not science and the lab part is science, but the FBI part is not, you don't get it. Look, if the defense got the lab part and saw something that then, you know, triggered additional a want of additional discovery. So now we're in a place where, yeah, of course, we're going to need more time because now they're going to be fighting over the other part of the file that they didn't get. Right. Yeah, let me so just go back for people who are a little confused. So she keeps saying IgG and I have joked with Sarah before that she's obsessed with IgG because she's always texting. Uh, sounds like a, sounds like a fertility IgG. or something. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, IgG is investigative genetic genealogy. It's a big part of the case, which you probably know if you've been following along, they, they used, um, you know, they found the DNA and the knife sheath and then they used investigative genetic genealogy to trace the DNA back to Koberger and invest and correct me if I'm wrong. Investigative genetic genealogy is basically like 23 and me. When you do the swab to find out your background that goes into a database. And then the FBI is able to access that database and basically like use all of our DNA to try and connect. Exactly. And the problem with that, and by the way, um, I think a better, Is that right. I, I mean, did I describe it basically the right yes. way? Okay. Yes, but it's like your family's DNA that yeah. they, they trace Familial, back. right, familial. They keep saying familial investigative. Yeah. Genetic, yeah. They, they also call it forensic genetic, which I think is the accurate way in the context of a criminal case to call it forensic genetic. Okay. genetic. But it's really interesting because it raises, I just, I, this is something off the, I mean, you know, you can check it out or your viewers can check it out. But there's a professor at the Maryland um, Law School uh, named Natalie Ram, who has for 15 years studied forensic genetic genealogy and made the argument in law review articles and stuff that it's unconstitutional, that it violates the Fourth Amendment. Because if you, if it's your own DNA that you're putting in there and you're checking off the bo box, you're consenting to its use by law enforcement. But when they get to your cousin, your cousin's not consenting <laughs> for his DNA to be in that database, right? So it's a huge constitutional issue that has never made it to the Supreme Court yet. And we're in this place like Koberger. And that's why I commend this judge, because 
most of the trial judges around the country have just flat out dis like denied any IgG material to the defense. Um, and so now we have someone who's like, okay, well, I'm gonna give you this part for whatever reason. We don't know what part, but um, but I just it raised a flag for me because I thought, man, if I was the lawyer, I'd be looking at what I'm getting and I'd be like, oh, I need some more. Here's why, you know. And yeah, and it's could, interesting the judge has said, um, you know, and I don't want to go too in the weeds here, but basically yeah. the defense was asking for more of the genetic genealogy documentation. The prosecution was nervous to give it up, basically saying, because you've got like innocent people's names, like like you said, your third cousin. I mean, who yeah. knows how they connected all these pieces. Right. And now we know that the defense and so the judge looked everything over and then made a decision to give certain stuff over to the defense. We don't know what. what? Um, yeah. But the judge has said, like, look, this is all new to me, too. Like this investigative genetic genealogy, like he, I think he might even said, like, this is the first time in Idaho we've really dealt with this. I have to educate myself on this. So it is a very interesting part of this case because there's it's not a lot new, of other and I think, examples out there. And, and I think for a judge, it takes some, some, you know, backbone to not be afraid because when you have no precedent, you're setting precedent, you know, judges get nervous about that and, and they don't want to do the wrong thing. And so, I mean, I was like, okay, well, at least he turned part of it over, but for a defense, for the defense, you know, when we get Whenever we get discovery, doesn't matter if it's IgG or anything else, um, we then do our homework based on that discovery. We talk to our experts, we consult, we, and then that leads us to asking for more discovery, you know, and we have reasons why we need this additional discovery. So I wouldn't be surprised if sometime soon Ann Taylor is going to come back with some sort of an additional discovery request based yeah. on the review of what they've gotten. And then that will, again, kick the ball down the road in terms of a trial date. Yeah, there's going to be so many little hiccups along the way, it seems like. But OK, so at least we have a good idea of what to expect for Friday. Are you going down there? No, I was going to. I had a flight booked and everything. And then I was just saying before I had you on here, I had like some family issues, family drama come up. Okay. So I'm going to and I'm actually now sick, too. So I'm going to be streaming. You know, they're streaming it now. Um, okay. So I'll be streaming it and watching it. But um yeah, and I don't uh, honestly. I mean, I do think these are. I do think it is a big day in terms of getting dates or yeah. Or, but um, and then also the rulings. But um, but not. It's so tough when you can't be there. You know? Yeah, there's a lot going on. Alex Capriello, our uh, our other correspondent, is going to be there. Okay, we'll, we'll see what happens. And I was just and you and I, my dogs are like we're about to there. You see what your, you see? My dogs back here. Wait, no, hold on. These two, they're both like, they're like, uh, oh my God, so cute. <laughs> um, well, you have a little one, don't you? I have two. Um, I have two. Let me see if he wakes up and runs away from me. Come here. Come here, say hi to Brian. You're going to make it on TV. News Nation. Oh my God. This is Billy, the oh Ewok. My God, Billy. <laughs> so cute. Um, well, as always, <laughs> I appreciate you helping us break it down, Sarah. Of course, Brian. And then I'll see you down South for. Yes. Murdoch. We're going to be at Murdoch together. Um, you're going to be doing analysis and I'm going to be there too, starting on Monday for the, uh, hearing. I was actually doing some research on that today on the plane back from New Hampshire. So that's another, that'll be the, the week after Coburger. So we've, we're going to be busy. We are. I will be joining you on Tuesday. So on Tuesday, I'll, right. I'll get there Monday night. But but uh, so you have to fill me in on Monday. OK, I will. All right. Thank you, Sarah. All right, thank you. Bye. Feel better.